session. So I'm very uh, pleased that Chris Flesch has agreed to come and deliver the next part of this, the workshop, on multi-level analysis. But um, actually, Mark recommended this, that we do a, um, a session and part of this workshop on time series and cross-sectional cross -sectional analysis. So it's perfect that Chris is here to notice, the, um, and you've met him, I'm sure, already, and you know he has a file in there, so I won't go through the details. And obviously, um, I think we'd like to hear a bit about the background, too, as you go through the um, sessions. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much, Susan. It's, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm a lot of you. I bet, I bet a number of you that I, uh, I, I like it to be four of you uh, before, before I go, and you go. Um, it's a hard act to follow, uh, Marco, and, uh, and I won't be following perfectly directly to begin with. Um, Marco comes more from a cross-sectional tradition, and I'm going to come, come more from a time series perspective. And where I think we'll end up is very, very close. I mean, he could have brought you along to uh, using technology which allows you to outfail nicely with kind of stuff, fairly nicely with the kind of stuff I'm doing. And I'm going to start on the other side for you close to that. And we're not going to quite get to the point where we're maybe wedding it all together because that, that's going to be part of the amount of work that we won't have time to do. But I think we'll see. I think you'll, you'll see it and hopefully you'll appreciate it. And, you know, please, please feel free to, you know, to, to, to let me know. Um, the, yeah, I, I, actually, it's, it's funny. I started off as a doing time series cross-section stuff when I was a graduate student a long time ago now. And I um, moved into other kinds of areas of research. I was a graduate student at the University of Iowa. I got my PhD in 1989. So that can kind of infer my age from that. Um, it's a milestone age. I'll give you a little hint. Um, um, so, uh, yeah. Um, it's milestones are much more fun from your point of view than they are mine. Probably Mark's, if I could speak for him. Um, after that, I went off to, uh, I was actually an IR scholar, and is an IR graduate student, international relations graduate student. And what happened is I was working with a guy named Ben Most. And he does some work with, uh, used to do work with Harvey Starr, Most of the Star, and those of you who know IR, like, like the other names. And Ben Most died in my third year of graduate uh, school, and, and I couldn't find anybody else in the IR really to work with on the project I had, so I had to shift gears. I had this really, really neat project I thought comparative politics, and I tried to, and it actually evolved the use of time to this process, and I ended up trying to find somebody who brought comparative to do this project, and I couldn't. I'm not that difficult to work with, uh, but it sure seemed like it at the time when I was a graduate student. I finally ended up in American politics, precisely because I could have somebody to work with them and there was a project to work on. Well, as, as a result, what that meant is a lot of my analysis moved from being kind of a uh, multi-unit to single unit. Um, it doesn't have to be that way, but it didn't did turn out that way. <coughs> what I, it, still, it, it still kept half of what I um, was working on in graduate student at the time, graduate school. Time, that's a time series department. So I've done a lot of work over time focusing on time series, increasingly focusing on cross-sectional series, cross -sectional time series work. As I've, uh, become more and more comparable over time. And most importantly, as data has become more and more available, this is why I think this is a, a useful, it's a very useful to, to, to uh, technology to have exposure to, increasing this over time. And even for those of you who are working with binary data, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, just so you know, in 1989, I headed off to the University of Houston, uh, about a year after, about six months after getting there, Mark Franklin joined the faculty. We had a great time, did a lot of really, really neat things together, became good friends, co-authors. Um, it's, uh, so I'm sure I'll often get on again with co-authors, but it continue to be more, more on now than, than before. I went off to Oxford in 2001. I uh, was at Nuffield, spent four years there, uh, then came back to where I am now, Temple University in, in Philadelphia. Some of you may know some of my colleagues there. Kevin Arson is one who seems to travel very well and has some really, really experimental stuff. There's a bunch of other really good people. Mark Pollock, most of you probably know him. Uh, a very, very famous uh, scholar. So we have others as well, and um, it's a great place to be. So if you're interested in coming and joining us, please do. I'd like to do work that's driven by ideas, but ultimately isn't settled by uh, with the mind, right? It's settled uh, with data. And so that's um, that's a little bit about me. I mean, I figure it's useful to have a little bit of background on this. Uh, 
If you want to know more, it's pretty easy to find out more. Okay, so what are we going to do in here? Um, here's the plan for the three sessions. We have a session today, right? Then we have a session tomorrow morning, then we have a session tomorrow afternoon. And this is roughly what we're going to do. Um, today we're going to spend entirely on time series. Okay, so we're going to be basically a, a, a sort of a history of time series methodology. We're going to be developing and introducing you to all the tools, all the tools of which are useful. And uh, will be exemplified today uh, uh, and or tomorrow uh, to, some, to varying degrees of depth. Uh, and uh, we'll do a little bit of hands-on. So it's not going to be a very, very tough session today. It'll be thin, but wide. Um, I was just sort of watching how things are going. Um, the morning sessions, if the morning sessions are tough, it's a little tough on you having a tough afternoon session. So you're not going to have a super tough afternoon session. You're going to have a tough morning session tomorrow. So we're going to be focusing on, so be ready, okay? Uh, you're going to go ADLs, but you have auto regressive distributed lag and error correction models. It's not really, really all that difficult. It's really, really, it just, just requires you to focus. And then we're going to stop, take a break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to spend uh, time on time series cross sections. It's also going to require you to focus, okay? Then we're going to take lunch, we're going to come back, and then we'll build on that stuff, and we'll be too bad. It'll be a little bit more like this afternoon. Uh, okay? Uh, just, just so you know, uh, we probably will use most of the full time today because it's not going to be a particularly demanding session. I want to make sure I get through. If we end early, if I get through everything I want to get through, we'll end early. Don't count on ending early. Um, just, just bear with me. We'll take a break. I know it says 3.30 in the schedule, but just so you know, if, it's, if, it's, if I see it working better to maybe run till 3.40, just bear with me. Don't, you know, please don't, you know, if you really must go, go. But, uh, yeah, you know, just bear with me. I mean, you're getting advanced warm. Okay, the data box. This is courtesy of Mark Franklin. Uh, a lot of what I know about time series cross section has been crystallized because I've worked with Mark Franklin. We, the actual research we do together, teaching we've done together, we did uh, something, a much uh, a version of, of what, what I'm doing here today uh, at, at the EUI about a year and a half ago or so. Now, which is, which is great fun. I think that didn't meet any of you there, but I don't know. Since uh, here's the data box that um, that we're ultimately interested in, right? We have uh, three dimensions to the data box, right? We have paces, time, mass down here, which is cut off variables. Let's get rid of that. Yeah. This is probably the proof. Okay, so cases, time, and variables, you, you can tell what, what's going on here, right? And so you have a bunch of cases. This is what we would consider our n, typically. We have our time units, which we would consider our t, and along here we have our variables, right? Now, typically when we're doing work, we're working with slices of these, this data box, right? For instance, the kinds of things that you've been focusing on in the sessions with Marco tend to be focusing uh, at, on a bunch of cases, right, and a bunch of variables at a particular point in time, which you're slicing this data box right here, right? Across a particular time point here or at some other particular time point. Uh, people who are working in time series, right, will, will be looking at uh, maybe one case, right? This is like a bunch of variables, right? Across time, so they'll be slicing this one into the data box. And, and what we're going to be doing here is be trying to get to the point where we're focusing on all three dimensions. So we'll go into this a little frustrating. So now let's just take a, take a simple look at two-dimensional uh, views of the box. This is cutting off. It's very, very thin. Um, it's better before. Let's see if we can get out. This 
just said full screen reader. Hmm? And then it cuts off. But then it cuts off. It's ridiculous. It's bizarre. Um, well, go back to where Tanner was. I think it's closed. Hit the close button. And it back. Okay, so here we are. This is a uh, yeah, fun. Okay. Um, so the typical approach that we have is we have a trend. We typically have a trend analysis, right? There are different ways to slice to look at these data in two dimensions. One is this is an unusual kind of matrix, right? When you have time in cases, this is not the kind of thing that you would normally put together, right? Um, but you would normally have something that's very, very similar to that, right? Which is, which is, uh, which is this chart, which plots cases over time, right? A dependent variable or an independent variable or other angles. coming over here, so bear with me. Uh, here's more customary representations, right? That I've already described. And we have cross-sectional analyses on the left-hand side, cases and variables. Right? And then you have classic time series on the right-hand side, maybe a single case or average of cases. Um, say individual level case. <coughs> here we have time by variables. Right? Okay, and of course, this is important, right? Um, both of these representations can be extended in a hierarchical fashion right, to represent units embedded within higher levels, countries or schools or regions or the like. And we'll, we'll tinker around a little bit of that. We won't do much. You've already had a lot of tinkering with that the last 12 hours of these sessions. Okay. Now, in order to actually do time series cross-sectional analysis, the typical approach to cross-section time series is to, 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 to you know, it started off really with, with, with as an extension of individual level cross-sections, right? We move from one observation to another observation to another observation. We're moving across what we call the panel, right? Uh, the, uh, the interest was not motivated very, very seriously by concern with time series. But when you're looking at time series cross sections, we would be focusing on not just a handful of time series, uh, time, time temporal observations, but many temporal observations. When you're looking at something that has many temporal observations, you can have interesting time series properties. <clears throat> While most of the focus of time series cross-sectional analysis, and particularly the methodology, has been on the differences across units, why people differ, why countries differ, why states differ, the fact of the matter is, is the bigger problems that you face when you're doing time series cross-sectional analysis can be those owing to time. The reason is, you can end up with estimates which are inefficient, and inefficient means you can end up with estimates which are following the data too much, going off too high, going off too low. And, and not only are the, the, the estimates being driven off left and right of the truth, but you also can end up with standard errors uh, being too high or too low. And as a result, you could be making you know, very, very incorrect inferences. And so if you pay, don't pay much attention to those kinds of concerns, you're going to have, you're going to have, uh, you're going to make really, really terrible inferences based on analyses. In order to get a, an appreciation for, for those kinds of problems, you know, to trace, um, Trace the problems, trace how we've dealt with them over time, how we've thought about them, and, um, um, and, and, then, and then play around with some time series before we, before we end the day. Okay, what is a time series? <coughs> and here it is, pretty, pretty straightforward. It's just a bunch of time ordered observations. Ideally, historically, we thought about it as having an interval level of measurement. We like to think of these observations as being, uh, being separated in time in a, in a constant way. So we have an observation every week, every day, every month, every year. To the extent we violate these, we don't quite have an interval level measurement, or we don't have actual constant time gaps. It's acceptable. There's a point at which it becomes unacceptable. What is that point? Well, it's not, you know, it's not parameter. Um, and so this is something you want to talk about. This is something you could diagnose. It has to be done more sort of in an ad hoc way, right? To be able to actually take cases where you have uh, fixed space. For instance, if you have variable time gaps, you work with data you have when you have fixed space, and you compare the results to when you're incorporating observations where the gaps are not constant. Some of this also can be, there's also sort of imputation techniques which can be used, um, which I can talk about too if you want, but those are actually pretty well known. Okay, so by this definition, a time series is discrete. Okay, so it's not a, it's not continuous. It's just by construction, right? But it can be a measure of continuous process. And most of you think of the processes underlying time series as being continuous. Okay. Now, so again, you're not actually representing the continuous process, right? You're getting these sort of protocols coming out of the process, and you can infer to the nature of this. This process may be in a way that would sort of theoretically would characterize it as continuous, even though we wouldn't actually have the data to describe that process in a continuous way. Okay. 
Okay, you know, measurement in time series is a big deal. I mean, why is that? Well, because things are different at different points in time. What's a lot of money today? If you tell somebody you made 50,000 euros back, uh, you know, 50 years ago, well, to the extent that euro existed, pounds, um, people would think you were making a great deal of money, but today, that's not a lot. No comparison. It's a lot of money made for you, but for people trying to live in London, it's very it's not. Some of them may have, may have contemplated that. Um, when you're looking at stock market prices, um, stocks have changed, right? We don't, where was Google, right? IBM, Apple, well, IBM was around. Most of them, many of the companies in the stock market, they were not 50 years before that. It was a different mix. The things we consume change. Consumer price index is something that we measure, right? Inflation, well, you know, how do you decide what inflation is? On what basis? I mean, is it the same things that uh, we're consuming, the same things 50 years ago to it today? No. The meaning of unemployment has changed. This crime is the same thing. Has it gone up? Has it gone down? There's lots of things. The same is true with political variables as well. Um, maybe not as much for a lot of the variables I think with. But it is a little different when you're asking somebody about how you feel. Let's say you're asking somebody how you feel about um, health care. Now, if health care has changed, right? You have to take that into account. So if we're spending more on it now, you may be possibly less than not less than supportive health care. Not because you want less health care than you did 50 years ago, or people did 50 years ago, but because we're giving more now, right? And so you don't want as much more on top of that than you did 50 years ago, or would have had you system in this survey. Okay, so measurement is a really, really big issue. Don't, um, measurement's a big issue in general, and I don't think it's actually, I, I, it's been, it was terrible through my graduate career. I think people just, I do a lot of work with public opinion and public policy, and people just, there were, you just didn't really even know what people were measuring particularly with respect to policy, but also with public opinion. Uh, I thought it, it fairly recently was getting better, but I, I'm not so convinced right now. So it, 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 it's very easy to, to not to not pay much. But the most important thing when you're doing these data analysis is you have good measures. You get bad measures with good methods, you get nothing. It's garbage in, garbage out. People say that, but you. I had a really nice conversation with Nina today at lunch, and she was she was reflecting this. And, I, and, I, and I'm signaling you out because I think it's great. I think you're very, very worried about doing certain things because of measurements. So I have the data, I could use it, I could do these analyses, but I'm not so sure what the results would tell me about the truth, right? About what you really think might be happening, whether it's consistent with what you want or expect to find or, or, or not. Measurement, though, is a really, really big deal in time series for the reason that it's always a problem measuring, but in time series, the world changes from right? its nature of time series. Okay, so what are the differences between time series and in, in the usual cross-sectional analysis, and here are some of them. I mean, you typically not necessarily have fewer cases. In cross-sections, you more often than not have independent data, right? Almost by construction, by definition. Whereas in time series, you have data which, de which is dependent. Have you heard these words before? Have you heard data described as dependent time series data? You always, or if you're asked to think about it, but you asked about independence, right, in the, of the observations, right? Well, time series data are definitionally independent. I'm asking you today, and then I'm asking you again tomorrow, right? I'm measuring public opinion in in Turkey yesterday, and then I'm measuring it tomorrow. Right? These are the same people. Right? Do we expect the observations to be independent? <coughs> if you're asking different people, you might say, yeah, I expect them to be independent. I'm asking Turkey, I'm asking Turkey citizens today, but tomorrow I'm asking people in Slovakia. Um, those are independent observations, probably. But if you're asking Slovakians today, and you're asking them tomorrow, probably not. What does that mean? Well, you've got violations right off the get-go, right? Can, can, you, can you apply OLS? Well, not so easily. There's some issues to deal with there. Model specification sensitivity. This I can go on and on and on about, but I'm not going to do that <laughs> right now. Um, sensitivity to influential cases. A premium on theory. Why is why is there a special premium on theory in time series? Do you think? Doesn't theory matter in cross sections as well? It always does. What? It always does. Yeah. Well, why do you think it might matter more in time series? Well, Yeah, how many, you typically have fewer observations to begin with. That's a problem. Um, it's 
takes time sometimes for things to realize. What do we usually say when we're working with cross sections? Are you happy if, if somebody said, well, I've got a survey of 30 people on learning regression? And I'm going to tell you all about people, Italians. But if you have 30 observations of a time series process, you're fine, right? Central limit there. Is 30 still a magic number, or they teach a higher number? None of you believe in those magic numbers. In fact, the manager, it's okay, right? Time series, there's 30 cases, right? It's fine, yeah, yeah. 10 cases, even 15, right? You're going to predict the lesson on this. How many observations do you have? 12. Okay, run with it. Publish it. Well, you've got a lot less cases, right? And our tolerance is a lot less. That's the, what I tried to point out is, of course you're going to say, no, you can't. You're not going to stop people from doing these results, right? But you're going to have to really, really place a premium on theory up front. You can't throw in 15 variables, right, if you've got 12 cases. Right? You have to do a lot of your work in advance. Right? It's a little like running an experiment, but not being able to run it. Okay, we need a lot of methodological theory and practice for three time series as well. Of course that's true with cross-sections, of course it's true, but you need a different kind of methodological theory and practice. Right? So we're going to talk about today. One of the things that I really <laughs> love about time series is um, a lot of our, well, we can look at a time, we can look at a variable, and we can assess whether the variable actually changes, and we can assess whether the, 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 the change actually lasts. Okay? <clears throat> These you can actually measure, right? You can actually measure change and you can measure persistence. And these are things that we oftentimes theorize about and we really want to know. Oftentimes we end up running analyses on cross sectional data because that's what we have. But we really think when you change somebody's circumstances, like you give them more money, they're going to change, right? Because if you don't think that, well then how could you possibly infer that people with more money, because of money, have different preferences? Right? If you don't think it's going to manifest itself over time, then what you've got in your own mind, right, is an unobserved heterogeneity that happens to be correlated with income. Right? Maybe it causes it. So why don't you just go study over time? You can actually go see, well, somebody's income changed. Did their preferences change? <coughs> Pretty great. When their income changed and their preferences changed, did the preference change last? When we shocked, this event had an effect on public preferences. Well, okay, let's go see. Okay. Shock, preferences changed, did the preferences last? Right? People try to come up with clever ways to do it cross-sectionally, right? Because it's oftentimes not that easy to do times with really. exposure, right? People who are exposed to the amount. Right, so we're more likely to change. So, you know, we have different preferences than those who, who weren't exposed to. Yeah, that's, that's, that's clearly a second or third best right? solution. Anyway, when we're, in, when we're focusing on time series, you just think of a simple equation. And there's a variable y, subscript t, right? Pretty straightforward. It is rho, right? I, I sometimes get the I'm probably going to get the Greek red letters wrong today. I'm not going to make it part of the because I'm in Turkey. I don't know. But uh, I'm going to, um, I, I think it's because I have problems with it more generally. But, um, but I do know this is rho. Okay, so you're going to have y is a, y is a function of, of y, a t is y, but it's a function of t minus 1. So what is this equation? Why is this equation useful? Well, it gives you two pieces of information that are really, really great. You get the error variance here, right? And this taps your shocks to y, it's right there. Yeah. So how much does y change? That's it. And then two, persistence, this comes from right here. If this is 1, right? Y is one. I mean, if rho is one, what is it tell you? Well, today is yesterday plus a shock. Right? That means yesterday's shock is still here today. And yesterday's shock will be here tomorrow along with today's shock. And the shock from two days ago is here today and will be here tomorrow. Right? Today is yesterday plus the shock. So you get the persistence plus you get the variance. Right? And the shock. So how much change and how much persistence? If this is less than one, what do we know? The shocks don't last. The closer it is to one, the longer they last. The closer to zero, the shorter they last. Right. So they're half, it's a half. You know, it's a life. Right? We'll think about this as some sort of uh, something that would translate into a half life, which is what a lot of scholars do. Right. Two thirds of the effect has gone by. Such and such is not really half life. Okay. Um, in theory, rho can be greater than one. Um, that applies an explosive process, right? Today is one and a half times yesterday. So yesterday's shock is not only here, but 50% of yesterday's shock is added on. And tomorrow, right, added on even more still, right? And that process just explodes. 
That's not a common. Do many of you theorize about explosive processes? There's been some research done on this in political science, which there's a certain explosive, there's a short run explosiveness, which is kind of interesting in the long run, um, uh, more long run equilibrium. So we have some changing conditions, and so we get a process that looks fairly explosive, but that's not that's not the norm, and it's not what we're going to be focusing on today. This equation is really, really useful. Uh, so keep it in the back of your mind. It's going to be helpful. Uh, proceed. Anytime you want to jump in, by the way, if you have a question, if you have a comment, you know, add filibustering. It does not do despite the practice of the U.S. Senate. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not a U.S. Senator. I'm not a Republican. So, uh, uh, okay. We're moving from cross section all the time, serial analysis. Okay, so um, this is pretty basic stuff. I'm going to give you these slides, so I'm going to skip over some. You'll see I'm just skipping over stuff. I don't like to read slides, but sometimes you do. Um, I thought it'd be useful because yeah, I could just give it to you, so I'll send them to you. Don't have these things. Um, these kinds of questions we're interested, in, right? You know, you know cross-sectional stuff, as we said, is you know why is one person more likely to vote than another? We're interested in right? why is the welfare regime in one country more generous than another? These are you know why are some countries peaceful and others more violent? And so we're interested in estimating these kinds of questions, right? Sure, that's that's fine. But sometimes, though, you're not interested in asking those kinds of questions. You're uh, you're interested in other kinds of questions, right? And here, instead of having this equation with individuals I, right, subscripted I, you'll replace the I's with T's, right? So you have the same equation, but you just, just replace the, the I's with T's. Why would we bother doing this? I've already hinted at some of this, right, in uh, our earlier discussion. You know, often our interests are explicitly time serial, right? I mean, we could ask the same questions that I just asked cross sectionally, right? In a time serial way. Why does a person's propensity to vote change over time, right? Why do welfare regimes change? Why do countries become more or less peaceful over time? Time series allows us leverage, causal leverage. Uh, I've already discussed this as well, right? Your income changes, your education changes. Does the dependent variable change? Uh, we get partly, 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 I should have italicized this, or boldly, mitigate issues of endogeneity via labs, right? Time series allows you to better disentangle causal correction, right? Of course. <laughs> but you can look at labs, right? Does it, does it affect lag as opposed to being current? When you're doing cross sectional, well, maybe you can't look at labs, right? When you have current observations, you're addressing current observations on. Current responses on some other current response. Um, this depends on, yeah, this, this is something that measure, depends on measure. You, you get, um, one of the things, the world sometimes really is very cooperative um, without trying to be, right? Um, you know, you end up with, I do a lot of work on opinion policy, two way flows, right? So how opinion affects policy change and how policy affects people's preferences, right? Policy. And the really neat thing is, um, you know, these are processes, right? So the public opinion, you have this process playing out, but it's really, really nice is you get this, you can get this process, you're measuring, say, opinion and policy at the same points in time, but they're not being measured at the same points in time of the year, right? They're both measured in 2009, right? But one, the public opinion measure is taken at a particular point in time. And you can see, okay, the process, the budget process, say, was finished, and then they took a snapshot, right? So it's measured at the same point in time, but you have a lag built in because the process ended in say September. Public opinion snapshot was taken in November, right? and the following year we did the same thing. <laughs> so you have oftentimes times with really really nice lags built into how the data are just delivered out in the world, right? How, you know, it's just wonderfully sometimes cooperative quasi-experimental way for you. Right? That's another thing: pay attention to measurement. A lot of people, for instance, are studying these kinds of things. What will they do? They'll, say, they'll take measures of the public opinion within the year. So they'll have measures at the beginning of the year. They'll add together with measures taken at the beginning, end of the year, middle of the year. Policy comes along in September. They take measures at the end of the year. They average those public opinion measures. So that's public opinion in 2009. Well, the problem is, is that there's two-way flows. Right? You're averaging opinion, which is going to influence policy, together with opinion, which is potentially influenced by policy. Right? You want to pay attention to that kind of thing. They're very, very sloppy, right? It's again the question of measurement. Sloppy, just does this average we're just calling it 2009. Well, the world gave you this really, really great lag right within the year, and you just threw away, right? Okay, so personally, not you. And you don't want to do that. So. Okay. Uh, as 
we've already discussed, you can do, um, you can assess change, right, and persistence, which is really great. Of course, you can do the time series and the cross sections together. You could add, you know, uh, multi level as well. But for today, it's entirely going to be focused on the single time series. Okay. Okay, how to analyze the time series? We've already gone through this. We could have again. Okay, one unit, just one little slice of that, that data box, if you recall that. We have n observations. So you call that T. Just think of that as T capital T. You'd be referring a lot to capital T, particularly tomorrow, capital N meaning cross-sectional units, capital N, and T, meaning um, time series. So time gaps are the same, maybe they're a level of measurement, fine, fine. Again, discrete, right? But we think it's probably some kind of continuous process. How do we analyze this data? Well, uh, a lot of you, I'm not sure how, how you were taught this. I mean, how many of you have been exposed to time series? That's it, okay. Uh, how many think they've been pretty seriously exposed to time series? One person. One and a half. <laughs> okay, one and a half. Okay. I'm glad I'm doing this. This was our suspicion. Uh, the, the way that this would be, you, most of you I'm suspecting are taught time series the way we thought about time series about 50 years ago. Okay? We have learned a huge amount in 50 years about time series. But this is the typical approach. Is the, what we call the times call an econometric approach. So what do you do? Right? You have this, you have this, you have this time series data, so what do you do? Okay, well, what do you do when you have uh, cross-sectional data? You use OLS, right? Uh, so we use OLS, and well, then you go check and see, you know, well, we've got these assumptions we've got to worry about, right? Is there any, which ones are we mostly worried about? We're worried about these gauss markov ones, right? We're worried about serial correlation, we're worried about end risk right? You know these things are probably cold, right? So what do we do? We probably didn't learn this, even when they're not OLS. Well, autocorrelation, I mean, if you, didn't, if you don't know autocorrelation, then you had trouble with Marco's session from the get-go, right? Because interclass correlations, right, were exactly, are basically that, right? So it's spatial autocorrelation, right? Which is really, really useful, as you're going to see tomorrow. We use those interclass correlations to, in random effects estimations, to get at unit effects. It's exactly how we do it. And kind of in a variant, variation on this. But basically, you've got errors, right, and your model are correlated, right, at particular points in time. If your error today, right, your prediction error today is correlated with your prediction error tomorrow, yeah, that's a problem, right? It's not independent. You know, it's a time series. We don't expect it to be independent, right? So you got to, it's a problem. you got to get rid of it, right? But when we have heterosky ethnicity, we've got to get rid of it, right? And then once we get rid of it, we're fine. We just go do our, do our estimator, all that, and, 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 and we're fine, right? So it's, it's a bump in the road. You, you straighten out the bump, you drill back over it the way we want to do it, right? Okay. So there it is. And you would do it if you, you would, basically the idea is you would estimate, um, uh, estimate particularly okay, autocorrelation, you would estimate what they call rho, you would transform your variables, both your x and your y variables, and then you re-estimate using all this, right? The nuisance is gone, because in the transform data, you got rid of your autocorrelation, right? The positive autocorrelations between the residuals, and now you move on, you're safe, you know, all this was back. And better as good as ever, right? Okay. When we do that transformation, we call that general generalized least squares. I didn't think I needed to write out ordinary least squares, but I'm writing out generalized least squares, which is short for GLS. I almost always write out the acronyms of this. Um, this is still really a common approach. I suspect that is this what most of you are taught? You got a problem? You're not taught that. Okay. But well, only the one and a half. Yeah, we have one, one of the one and a half. Um, <laughs> the rest of you, I, I haven't gotten the feedback yet. Maybe you've forgotten what you were talking about, or they're going to be buried deep inside your brain. Um, they were not toward GLS. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, How do you know? Because I'd be European, you know. <laughs> I've been fighting my colleagues at the EUI for five years on the question of what kids ought to be taught. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, uh, anything else? <laughs> Okay, this is still a common approach, and it's a common approach, particularly when we have small m and so for, if you're not interested in dynamics, like where do these dynamics come from? If you have if you have small ends, it's really hard to do much else. If you're not interested in the dynamics, well then you're not interested in figuring out where it comes from. And this autocorrelation can come from a whole variety of sources. 
there's going to be an inertia, the lady, the influence of shock. There could be data smoothing you didn't know about. Right? When people take moving averages of public public opinion polls, right? We're going to report a poll every three days, right? You started analyzing those data as if they're independent observations. Guess what you have? All the correlation. Built right in. Why? Two thirds of the three day moving averages, two thirds of the data are common from day to day to day to day to day, right? Guess what you're going to get? Beautiful time series dynamics, right? Real? No. Probably the most compelling. Uh, this is actually um, Moving averages, right? So those are specification errors. There's a whole variety of reasons. If you're not interested in this kind of stuff, you should be worried about this. Because um, that'll affect the rest of it in other ways. But if you're not interested in, you know, if you're not interested in this kind of stuff, then this is, you know, this is the kind of thing that's, uh, that people typically, typically uh, um, use. See, the problem is, oh, our last estimates and our picks are, um, are unbiased. And they need to do that correction. That's spot for this. Hope I didn't cut somebody's movie off. Um, okay. Um, okay. Okay. All assessments are unbiased, right? But they're they're inconsistent, right? Or inconsistent, I'm sorry, but they are inefficient. The inefficient is really, really important. In some ways, they're more, it's more important than bias. You might think that's silly. Why is that the case? Because what inefficient estimates, what inefficient estimates are, are estimates which can, which vary more, right? They can be off further from the truth, right? So the distribution of mass estimates is going to be greater given a particular sample size, right? There's also going to be that you're going to have standard errors that are wrong. So you're sitting there making potentially really horrific inferences. And presumably, presumably, you're interested in that. That's why you're here, right? Positive oral chemical correlation is very common and very consequential. Um, it really seriously understates standard errors. This is the big problem. Negative autocorrelation is less common and less consequential. Um, negative autocorrelation is, I mean, if you have to think about it, it's a positive autocorrelation. In the case of this, we have Your errors at a particular point in time. You know, positive, 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 negative, negative. Negative autocorrelation. This is positive serial correlation. Negative <coughs> serial correlation. A little more like that. Positive, negative, positive. That doesn't have to be exactly alternating it to be. And you can get a kind of jig, this jigsaw pattern like this from something really, really simple that you experience all the time in your data. For instance, sampling error. The sampling error is data one day, and it's gone the next. And so you're going to get a big error, and you're going to predict a smaller error next time. Right? Particularly when you get a really big error, you're going to predict a smaller error next time. Different for, say, for instance, what we find with the stock markets. What happens when stock markets go up by 500 points in a day? What's your betting the next day? Profit taking, right? It goes down. That's not measurement error, right? That's a response to conditions, right? I'm going to take profit. Things went up. I'm going to take my profits up. This is what I just told you the story about about, about sampling error. It's just it's just measurement error. Right? There are other sources of, of negative autocorrelation too. Positive autocorrelation is much more interesting. And much more consequential. Okay, this is really really important. You know, everything is a matter of degree, right? You're, you're almost always going to find some serial correlation, but you know, a little serial correlation is not a big problem. Okay? A big serial correlation. Okay. How do you detect it? Well, visualization is one way, right? The great thing about time series is you can easily visualize data. Just plot it. You always plot time series. You will be, in fact, papers can do. I mean, do you ever see a time series paper, article published, that doesn't plot the time the time period? That's what I want to see what it looks like. When you're looking at pool, you're here, you're looking at stuff like that, right? Looking at pattern data. If you're looking at um, if you're looking at pool data, what are you looking for? You've got 15 countries. Are they operating at different levels? Right? Are they showing different variances? Those are important questions. Right? And you just plot it. You're going to tell a lot right off the bat. So it means anything fancy. Uh, but you're going to need to provide something fancy, right? You can't just eyeball your way through this stuff. You have to actually provide statistical tests. You probably are familiar with this Durbin Watson D statistic. It's a can, this is standard, right? 
great step. Uh, kind of unusual that they set it up so that um, you're taking the, the difference between the errors and squaring those differences and summing them all, right, and dividing by the sum of the squared errors. And, you know, Mark was one who, you know, likes to go off on this one a little bit. Why the heck did the, you know, no autocorrelation is a two. Like, why is this, why couldn't they make it zero, right? And then, you know, and of course, you know, positive autocorrelation is closer to zero, right? And why couldn't they make it so it was the other way around, right? So, so you know, <coughs> don't get them started um, on this. Uh, in practice, actually, so this is what it is. So if you're up in this, if you're up close, you know, so if it's close to, if it's up here, you have negative closer towards four. You have negative autocorrelation. If it's closer to zero, you have positive autocorrelation. Two is, is this is the long run, like this is a big T um, uh, neutral point. But in practice, when you're actually doing this stuff, the, the, the neutral point's going to be below two. Like if you're working with 20 or 25 observations, 1.85 or so will be uh, where, where you would you think the, the neutral is uh, with no autocorrelation. Uh, Stata, that's what you do. Everything will be in Stata today, tomorrow. Um, with the lab dependent variable, you don't use the Durbin Watson D, you use the Durbin Watson H. And there's the state of the map. Okay. You could do uh, cross multiple labs. Sorry about that. Did it fly? Very good. Um, the Bruce Godfrey test, which is just the brain multiplier test. Um, and it's basically you're addressing the residual on your x variables and lab residual or residuals, and you're testing the significance of this here. Which is another way of seeing whether or not there's a relationship between uh, residuals at time t and residuals at time t minus 1 and 1 to t minus 2. Uh, this is usually. It's estimated using a Cochrane ORCOT, which is this sort of repeated estimation procedure, right? Using feasible generalized least squares. Everybody, is everybody pretty much familiar with generalized least squares? GLS is theoretical, right? It's mathematical statistics stuff. And so whenever you actually go about estimating it, you can't use GLS. You have to use something like feasible GLS, right? Which means you're, you, have to, you have to operationalize it, right? And so that's why it's always given some kind of uh, adjective in front of the GLS. It's so really clever, you know, you run this regression of y on x, you take these residuals, right, which is just your y minus your a minus your ex, right? And then you regress your current residuals on your lab residuals, and you get that estimate of rho, and then you transform both y and x, subtract, you're subtracting out right, this portion of y from y and lag y, and this portion of lag x from x, and then, so you've got this new y, y sort of hat, right, star, the next star, and you run that regression, and then you go back, right, produce the residuals, and you analyze it again. You just basically equal up, you know, if you're finding an equilibrium estimate here, but it works. Really, really nice stuff. This is the kind of thing, you know, nothing magical about most statistics. I and mean, if you were, you know, if you were asked to, you know, come up with some way of drawing regression lines, you'd probably do something like OLS, right? You know, you might use absolute errors. You might use cubed errors, right? Absolute value of cubed errors. You might do something like that. But you just maybe one and a, you know, one and a half. Maybe do some kind of, you know, estimate like that. Um, and this is probably what you would do if you're trying to correct for serial correlation uh, among your errors. Okay. There's another procedure that this procedure loses a case, right? Um, because of the lab here. Um, there's a way to reintroduce that first case, which could be really important to you if you don't have a long time series by imputation. I'm not going to go through that now, but it's very easy to find this online. Very, very easy. And the standard way of doing GLS, that's it for you. You don't normally have to worry about it. You use Craig Swinston and Craig Winston. It's the standard methodology in data. It is now, but it's not default. You have to tell. You have to say, what is it? Forget what the can is. You have to tell it um, to, to estimate it for you. And so, just, 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 you know, it's, it's the, it's, it, it's a perfectly acceptable imputation. It's not. It's just backing it out um, from the other data. Remember, this is this is a problem when you're working with. You know what the first case is in a sense from the other cases and the means. So that's uh, that's really what you're, you're doing. This this CO is for Cochrane Markov, which is what we just described. This procedure of iteration, right? Iteration and estimation. Uh, is much like this autoregressive distributed lag model. And you don't have to know, really, don't remember this, we're going to come to this and forget it. I'm going to reintroduce it later today, we're going to spend a good amount of time on it in the morning tomorrow. 
This is autoregressive. Autoregressive because y is a function of yt minus 1. Autoregressive, right? Self-regressive. Uh, distributed lag, why? Because of that. You could also have other lags in the distributed lag model. I mean, other, um, you could have a second order model which would have other lags. You could also have other variables in the distributed lag model. But, um, okay. It is. It's all aggressive because of lag y and distributed lag because of lag x. Okay. So, this is okay. Um, Okay, so that's autocorrelation. Heteroscedasticity, also we would do it by visualization, do it by testing as well. It's oftentimes a little trickier to see heteroscedasticity, um, depending on how extreme it is. Um, how do we go about doing it, how dealing with it? Um, there's this, uh, yeah, these, these, these names, big names are Robert Engel. Have any of you ever heard of Engel or Clyde Granger? Probably heard of Granger. Granger causality. Does everybody know Granger causality? Do you all know how to do that? Christmas past, what was Christmas? Uh, yeah. Um, um, That's what it's famous for. Well, one of the many things it's famous for. Uh, yeah, but might have a little more use than, than that example. Uh, not, 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 not a whole lot, maybe. Uh, uh, see, I mean, theory is important. Right? You, know, you have to. You have to. You can't be dumb. If you're dumb, you probably aren't in this room. Um, so what do you do when you're dealing with heteroscedasticity? Uh, this ARCH procedure is useful. It's a variation of what we already just did with autocorrelation. And here you, you take these squared residuals, because you're interested right in the variance, and you're lagging them on uh, the lag square, right, residuals. It's not as big a deal in political science, but it can be. Okay, and you're doing a test on that. This stuff's very easy to find. You know, what I'm giving you here is not, you know, not, there's not much value added to what I'm doing here. There'll be more now. Um, how many of you know a REMA model? One, two. Okay, Susan, two. Okay, um, a REMA model. This, um, after, you know, there's the econometric approach, which again is still alive today. A lot of people, I don't have the statistics to back this up. I can't say that 50 to 80 percent of the pieces published using time shared data use it. But my guess is this is half of the pieces, roughly, maybe more, maybe less, use just that standard econometric approach. I use it sometimes. Sometimes, you know, if you don't have big N, you can't really do much, right? With this, you know, you can't take anything very seriously, right? With big N. That's small. Um, so along came, along came, it's a long time ago now. Uh, along came these guys, Box and Jenkins, and they came, they came up with something called Arima Monolite. Right? And that's what it stands for right there. Autoregressive, integrated, right? Moving average. And it was represented like this. Arima, PDQ, where the P refers to the autoregressive process, the D refers to the integrated process, and the Q refers to the moving average process. So if you had a, an Arima 111, that would be first order autoregression, first order uh, integration, and first order moving average. And the, the goal of this ARIMA process here was to actually not try to, is to actually re take this and model the errors explicitly, right? The errors that you're finding in this other process is just correcting and, and, and this is actually to model them directly and then produce these residuals, which are white noise, and then do your analysis. So you're stripping everything out of the, you know, all the systematic error out of your dependent variable and you're left with this called white noise. And that's what it looks like. You know, if you plot this stuff, it looks like you know, savage. You know, nothing, it looks like nothing's going on. Right? That's the whole idea. Okay. That's, that is if you want to, right? So the reason why I say if you want to, because a lot of people back in the day were just happy to do this. You know, I reduced it to white noise. You know, I found these error processes. And they publish a lot of people. Look at these error, these error processes. These defendant variables. You know, most of us are interested in X is causing Y, right? So we want to take that and then go do something with it. And they help us a little bit with that. But this was not maybe the, the best approach for that. Okay. Okay, so here it is. Just define these errors, the sources of error, and strip them out of your dependent variable. Right? This is really, really a big deal. Uh, and let's hit this page. And it became a battle, a uh, uh, war, and, and the political, and, and, and this is mostly in economics, right? Or what? Wars are first fought, right? The methods are in economics. And then we join in late, um, pick a side. Um, Sometimes the winner is the loser, usually the winner. 
Um, okay, relevant to this is this process, these two, these two words here, nation, stationary versus non-stationary. What is a stationary variable? What is a non-stationary variable? For the most part, a variable is stationary if the mean and the variance are constant. Okay? If the mean changes over time, Right? Meaning the level of the series changes over time, right? Or the variance of the series changes over time. Then you have something that's not stationary. And we just that's what kind of series do you think that is? Yeah. Non stationary or stationary? Why not? No bonus points. Okay, but does it move up? And then it moves back down. All right. Right. And that's the first tell. It doesn't move, right? What's what's your mean over here? What's your projection of the center? Somewhere around here, about the same. Right? Um, well, you know, the problem is that you could say, well, maybe it goes up a little bit, right? It might. So where is the eyeball? How about the variance? Does the variance change over time? But you remember, you, 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 don't, you don't want to, you, know, you got to be careful. Right? You don't want, you know, here it's lower than the camera, but if you think about up here, is that different to this part? Or is this part different to that part? Or this part? You know, it doesn't look like it, right? It's not. It's not non stationary. It is stationary, right? It has the same. In fact, as I'll tell you in a moment, it has the same mean and the same variance by construction. That's an order of process which is. Now, it's important for us to tell whether or not a series is stationary or non-stationary. I'm just going to get, you'll see why as we get through this. Um, trend and drift. Trend is, so, is, a, is a change in the level of the series. Right? Thus, anything that trends over time is stationary or non-stationary? Non stationary is very good. Um, okay? A drifting series is not non stationary. It is stationary. The series we just saw drifts, right? It drifts up, comes back down. It drifts down, comes back up. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. If it goes up, 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 you could have, you could have a trending series with drift too, right? Which is not uncommon. Okay? okay so here it is. The key to trend is it has to be deterministic, right? It has a coefficient before it and the standard error, right? It's important. You could estimate it. Right? It's evident here from that coefficient of one. If you have a trending variable, right? And you detrend it, right? You subtract out the trend from it, you will make that variable stationary. Unless the rest of it's non stationary. Because what if this other stuff, what if this coefficient is 1? What's going to happen to y? It's going to be non stationary. So if, if this is 1 and you detrend it, you're not going to get rid of all the stationary stuff. So it's still going to, it's still going to exhibit um, movement over time. The level of the series will change and the variance of the series will change. In fact, it will turn out to be. In order to get that, to get rid of that, you know, from the Arima point of view, the Vox Jenkins point of view, to get rid of that non-stationarity, you have to difference the series. And differencing will come up a lot today. You probably know first differencing, right? You take y, t minus 1, and you subtract it from y, t, typically indicated with a delta sign right before it, and you difference y. And that will work. Okay, more on this. What is autoregression? Autoregression is pretty simple. I mean, we've already hit that at a good amount because we gave you... Um, the auto, we talked about the autoregressive parameter, right? Uh, relating y and y two minus one. Okay, autoregression here are these coefficients p, right? Before the y t minus one, y t regressed on y t minus one, regressed on y t minus two, uh, and these p's are uh, your autoregressive parameters. If you have a first order autoregressive parameter, you just have the p one. If you have a second order autoregressive uh, auto process, I'm sorry. You have a P1 and a P2, and so on. Most of the time, you're going to be dealing with final autoregression, it's going to be just the 
first order, you might find a second order, and in some cases, it's not, not that. It's super uncommon, so it's, it's a, you know, don't rule it out a priori. Particularly if you have suspicions, like some Bayesian kind of thinking would apply to the second line as well. Um, seasonality, you know, monthly data. If you're looking at tax returns, right, tax revenues, you know, if you've got monthly data, well, in the United States, April's a big spike, right? Um, so you'll have every 12 months there. You might have other kinds of processes and variables as well. Okay. AR processes describe geometric decay, right? Okay. What does that mean? Let's just take a first order process. You have a shock. Yeah, 
40 times 8 is what? 32. 32 plus 10, 42. This is going up, this is going down. Going to 50. It will always go 50. You know, shocks get thrown off, right? But that's, that's why it's not always 50. It takes time for things to be case. Okay, so that's an autoregressive process. I've heard of common process. That's a process. Moving average process is a little different. Is everybody clear on that? It should, should be fair. I'm assuming this is pretty straightforward for you. If not, just say something. We're not done with these, but just say something. Less common is the moving average. And here, if you notice, there's no yt minus 1s, right? Here we're describing y as a function of previous shocks alone. We could do that for the autoregressive. I could have written the autoregressive equation as a function of all previous shocks, right? The sum of all previous shocks, right? Remember, we just did 0.8 plus 0.64 of the et minus 1s, and then you do the other equation for et, you know, other 2 minus 2s, 2 minus 3s, 2 minus 4s, so you're summing all this up, right? But in an AR process, all you have to do is write it as, as, as 0.8 times yt minus 1, 0.6, whatever. This is nice. So here it's different. You can't write it that way, right? Because it, it doesn't work that way, right? Here you have today is a function of yesterday's shock. It's first order, right? It's today's shock plus a portion of yesterday's shock, right? It sticks around, and then it goes away. It's finite. In fact, it's here, day, two days, three days, whatever, and then it's gone. Unlike the error process, it doesn't trail off to zero. So, you know, infinite decimal round, it goes to zero, right? It's positive or negative, and then it goes to zero. Most of the things you're thinking about, you don't have these kinds of, you have most of the, if, uh, most, of, most of your models, we had to pick, but most of my models are AR or MA. What would you pick? The way you think about how the world works. Yeah. I mean, you might if you disagree, it's fine too. But I mean, I just, I'd like to hear about it. That's, that's what I'm asking. MA processes do happen sometimes. They happen in measurement. We already talked about it. Right? We're talking about holes. You're in common. That's you know, that the common in that process. It just might be the way the world works, right? But maybe that our intuition about the air processes is wrong, and that's really mostly. Yeah, they'll be stationary too. This is not a regressive process, but, but MA processes obviously will be stationary, right? You get this shock that's here today, it's here tomorrow, that's gone. Well. So you go back to the, the mean. Right? Okay. Okay. You could have processes with, which have both processes together, uh, an auto regressive and an MA. And for instance, here at in RMOP, this is actually a pretty common process where the moving average picks up some measurement error type stuff. Um, it's also, you know, we also see it, well, I'm not going to get into it, it also works well with combined processes, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, and this one contains an AR1 and an MA1 process. If it was an ARMA2-1, it would be an AR2 process together with an MA1 process. Right? These are just two processes, error processes, operating together in the data. Okay. Again, as I said, AR and MA processes are stationary, they have constant mean, they have constant variance. Also, and this is really important for what we're doing in here, they're covariant stationary. And this refers, this, this takes a little bit of focus here. If you notice, we're not, I'm not demanding that much of you today. This is pretty, this is a nice afternoon session, right? We have a break, have coffee, come back, you know, nice to be. Okay, and then we'll work really hard in the morning. Um, uh, so, okay, the constancy of these autocorrelations, and the way you need to think about this, this, this is a, just give me about a minute of your focus if you can. This is the correlation between y. Uh, at time t and t minus 1, so figure, say, really late in a time series, is the same as the correlation between y, t, and t minus 1 early in a time series. Right? So what you're saying, it's not that hard, but it just does require your focus, that the correlation between the two is the same here as it is here in the lab course, or second lab, but it's the same first lab. Y, T, and T minus 1, here, 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 for the same, everywhere we go. Maybe not technically, right, your estimate might not for but the idea is that it's within, you know, it's within the wall mark, right? Your, your expectation is not the same. Or it does not do The expectation is the same. That, that turns out to be pretty useful. Uh, although, yeah. So, okay, so how do we know? Um, how do we know? If we have one of these processes, um, I'll, be tough. Um, I'll give you a little example here. 
Well, this process, we look at this curve, right? We look at this, this data here. Uh, we don't know it's autoregressive. So it's really nice because when you create your own data, it's just great, isn't it? Um, but most of you can't do that. So you uh, you have to deal with the data that comes to you. And here, here's, you know, here's you look at it and say, yeah, it looks stationary. Uh, and then you're wondering, okay, it's probably autoregressive, but you know, how do I know? How can I tell? So what you do is you use these, you need to find out, you need to look at these two correlation functions. One's an autocorrelation function, that's a correlation with self, right? Like autobiography, autocorrelation. You take y, you correlate it with yt minus 1, yt minus 2, yt minus 3, yt minus 4, times t minus 5. You lose a bunch of cases, right? The further we go, and you see what that looks like. If you have autocorrelation, I mean, I'm sorry, if you have autoregression, Remember 0 0.8, 0 0.64, 0 0.51, right? Your correlation should decay geometrically, right? If you have a moving average process, what will you have? It does have one correlation, right? For the normal, if it's a well, first order moving average. If it's a second order moving average, you'll have the two. It's for, just really just focus on it. You, the autoregressive is the one that most of you focus on. You know, from there you're looking at the geometric decay. So your correlation, if the, if the parameter is 0.8, what should you get? Correlation between y and y t minus one should be 0.8, and correlation between y t and t minus two should be 0.64, right? And so as you see this decay, right? It looks like this, going back in time. T minus one, t minus two, and go on to the next year. Trends towards zero, right? The number reaches zero. And you know, let's go see what we find. Let's, so you know, let's see what we got. So we have this data. So let's do here. We just call it in state. We use ACF, auto correlation function. And here's the variable I think that we're working with. Oh, sorry, AC. Okay. It's really slow. I don't know why. And what do we got? What's that look like? Doesn't require you to go out on a limb too much. What do you think? What kind of process? Here we have the lab, right? Autocorrelation, 0.8. Zero, uh, first lag, second lag, third lag, fourth lag, fifth lag. Does that look geometric, the decay? Yeah. It's exactly what you would expect of an autoregressive process. Okay? That's your first tell. Well, your second tell, right, after looking at the picture. Um, so what do we want to do? Check. Well, we want to make sure there's nothing else left in there. We think there's something that looks like a first order process, right, because the correlation is dropped off. So what we're going to do is you, can, you look at the partial autocorrelation. What that does is that takes into account the previous correlation. So you go controlling for the correlation at time t minus 1, what's the extra correlation right at t minus 2? Right. And what we want to find is we think it's on a regression. We want to say controlling for that initial process, right, that first order process, there should be nothing left. So there should be zero partials. And that's what we get. So the first correlation. 0.8 and then it goes to zero. That's exactly what you expect. So controlling, they, they always give you the first correlation. So you know basically the first correlation from the AC, right? And then they say, okay, controlling for that, what are we all? We're all sitting at zero. Right? Some of these might say, oh well, this one, maybe there's a lag 40 process going on. Do you want to take that very seriously? No. But you have 40 estimates here, right, of autocorrelations. Don't you expect a couple of them to sort of maybe get above the wire? Yeah, right. So, yeah, that's what you have there. Uh, unless you have a process, you know, if you have a theoretical model, lag 40, that's going to be really wicked. Then you go uh, in front of that, but most of you won't. Okay? So that's what we do. In that case, we diagnose it as an autoregressive process. It looks like an auto, it looks stationary. Um, it, it's, uh, and, uh, and we can model it as, uh, and we model it as, a, as, a, as a, it, should, it has its traces, its autocorrelation traces. Now, some people are going to say, okay, well, okay, well, if you think it's uh, an autoregressive uh, process, well, then what should you do with it? Um, by the way, this partial autocorrelation process is really good to see if it's second order, if you have a second order process of one. So we'll see extra stuff you've got, I've got to go back to the drawing board. Uh, or an ARMA process, right? Well, it's also a moving ARMA system. Oh, we're not going to get to all that. Okay, so estimation. Now, remember, we're interested in these white noise residuals, so what we can do is we can go right back to ARIMA. Okay, let's go to Arima. And 
what do we think the process is? So we think it's one, one A on regression. How many integration? I haven't built it. That's right, so let's put that at zero, right? And we don't think there's any anything else. We basically don't think there's anything else on because when we did the bottom correlation, so what did we find? Yeah, so so you know we just we found nothing else, nothing partial. So we just think it's an autoregressive process. So we go ARIMA, ARA, that's our variable, autoregressive A's. The reason I call that ARIMA one autoregression. I made a mistake here. No. No integration, no moving average. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna estimate that. Okay. From that, then we're gonna say, okay, this is uh, here's our coefficient on the error parameter, just above 0 0.8, which is what it should be. Constant is zero, right? Not significantly different from zero. The shocks, the variance of the shocks, standard deviation of the shocks, and the variance of the shocks is one, right? Which is what I did by creation. Remember, I said zero mean one standard deviation, so this is perfect. It's exactly it backs out the shocks from the estimates, right? Because it doesn't know the shocks, but it gives you an estimate of the variance of the shocks. Um, of course, it doesn't get the shocks right, right? Because it doesn't, it doesn't know the shocks. But, um, um, but it gets the average shock, in effect, right? So what are we doing here? So now we want to look at the residuals, right? Are the residuals, so what do we do? We predict, uh, call resid, residuals. And now what do we want to do with our residuals? What's the first thing you would want to do? Yeah, very good. That's, that's like, you know, that's true. You know, Fox and Jenkins are smiling, smiling. So what do we want to do in order to, to really give a hard statistical estimate? We just do the same things we did, right? We do autocorrelation, resist. What do we find? Bouncing around, look at this. Occasionally get some peaking over at 0.02, you know, minus 0.02. You're going to get this random stuff, ignore it. Partials, same thing. Right, nothing going on here. So what do we conclude? It's a first order water regressive process. Once you deal with that process, you've got white noise, and now you can proceed to estimation. Happy days. OK, so now, what if you have not an auto regressive process or a moving average process, but you have an integrated process? That's a little bit trickier. And this is where phi equals 1. OK, and in fact, remember what we said before is this process integration process, and the way to think about it is that it integrates, right? Or sums shocks, sums them up. The integration does, right? Your calculus types. It's non-stationary, right? Shocks do not decay, but they accumulate, right? They last forever, right? This is powerful. Effect lasts forever is a big deal, right? The funny thing is you really oftentimes, most of you are not theorizing short-term effects. Most of you don't, many of you may not even think about whether the long-term or the short-term, because you're maybe not thinking about this kind of thing. But to the extent you do, most of you are saying, yeah, well, I think it affects them forever, right? You know, their income goes up, sure. Yeah, you know, why, is it, why, is it gonna, why don't they go, their income goes up and they change their premises? Why is it going to change if their income doesn't change? If their income changes, I expect it to go If their income changes, it went up. Why wouldn't their preferences stay there now that it went up, right? Do you expect this permanent, you expect change, or do you expect first persistence, right? Do so you expect one? So it's, it's, not, it's an important question, right, for most of you when you're doing this kind of research. In this case, though, the mean varies, right? Because the series really it drifts, it goes up. Down, you know, you know the random, random walk process is what this is, and the and variance increases over time. In theory, this process goes, the variance goes to infinity, and the series just goes way off, and up, and way up, down. Okay. The way, the best way to think about um, an integrated process is, it doesn't. I find this really useful. Is this, this goes back to what I was just talking about with income. It doesn't just change on its own. If something, if if you don't have a shock, what is the prediction? Of y. Shock is zero. What's y today? Y minus y. Yeah, exactly. Important. What happens if you have an A process, AR process? Today, no shock. Where does what happens to y? Does it stay the same? It stays the same only if it has one value. No. It stays, no, the A, the, the, the y has one. If y has the equilibrium value, remember the example here? If y is at 50, then y doesn't change. But if y is anywhere else, y will change with no shock, right? 
y will go down or y will go up unless it's 50. And then you predict it to be 50. Right? Until it's another shot. Because right? remember, it's equilibrated, right? The integrated spheres are not equilibrated. They're wandering. You know, walk this way, you stay there. And you walk this way, you stay there. You walk up this way, you throw a few heads in a row, you end up over there. You throw 15 tails in a row, you end up here, kind of like you're drunk. Right? It's like you do a random walk.
And then if you take the difference, what do you get? 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. You know, is, this, uh, is this stationary? Well, that's not stationary, right? The mean varies, the mean varies over time. What else varies? The variance varies, right? See how it's expanding? Here, uh, the variance, is the variance expanding? Well, it depends on how you, if you think of variance, it's above the third. If you draw a line through it, it's, it's, trying to, it's definitely the mean's definitely changing. Right? Definitely say that, right? The mean is definitely changing. So we have difference it again, and we difference it again, and what do we get? 2, 2, 2, 2. Is that stationary? Yeah, it's a constant, right? That's, that's the most stationary of all. Um, yeah. Okay, so I3, I wouldn't worry about it. I2, yeah, you don't see that very often, uh, but it can happen. Okay, how do we find out? We'll go to ACFs and PACFs again. Show you, here we are. The data, uh, this, this variable is called Q, okay? That's just accumulated things. So you autocorrelate, autocorrelations. Does that look like an autoregressive or moving average process? What would we expect if it was autoregressive? Geometric decay, right, very good. And if we're moving average, we'd see a spike or two, right? And the zeros. What do we see here? The correlation between a, the various series at one point in time and another point in time, virtually one, all the way back to lag 40. What does this mean? I got to think about it. The correlation, unlike the ACF for the water aggressive process, which is kind of easy because it's that 0.8 times 0.8 times 0.8 and so on, this is a little bit trickier. You think it's one times one times one. Um, but it's still going to slowly decay because over over time you get the shocks, right? And so the variable as you get one shock, another shock, another shock. You know, today the difference between today and yesterday is one shock. The difference between today, you know, two days ago is two shocks, right? The difference between today and a month ago is 30 shocks, right? Between a year ago, 365 shocks. So even though today will a year ago has right, today has everything that was in a year ago, but also has 365 new shocks, right? So there's going to be differences. But it's going to decay. Really it's just going to be those new shocks that bring you down. So the amount of variance in the shocks is going to Determine whether this is flat or you know it drops down you know, a little bit, right? Um, and, but the idea is, is when it's high, it stays high, right? It was high back, you know, 300 years, 300 days ago. It's high today. Will you predict tomorrow? High. It's low. Will you predict low? Because it's not decaying, right? Back to the to the equilibrium. If it was decaying back to the equilibrium, it wouldn't stay high, right? It would go back down. That's why you get the 0.8 times 0.8 times 0.8 and so on. You follow that? You know you're smiling. Is it Glee? Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes. I mean, I'm happy to linger. I mean, I, I, I move on just because I figure you're getting bored. So, uh, you know. I mean, if you're not getting bored, say something. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, Okay, non-stationarity. Um, there's more formal techniques we're gonna we're gonna work on later too. Um, I should show the PAC up yet. PAC. What should happen? That, right? One correlation of one and then everything else zero. There's nothing else after you take into account the AR lag process, which is a 1.0 coefficient, right? So how do you get rid of the that you difference it? Right? So you go arima zero, one, zero, right? Zero water regression, one integration, all it does is difference the variable, zero moving average, and you're going to get stationary residuals. Okay. okay. You're going to get the white noise. White noise is stationary, right? Non stationarity is a big problem. Um, and the way to think about this is it's really simple. I mean, you've, you've heard of crazy regressions, it's a little like Mark's example of Granger causality. Things trend, right, for a whole variety of reasons. If you have a non stationary process, it's just going to, because of the shocks, it's going to trend up, right, over time. Like our series just randomly trended down. It was randomly generated, but right? it trended down. Now, if you regress that with anything else that's non stationary, right, you're going to find a relationship, right? Any kind of trend, right, at all, any kind of drift, in effect. Um, and so you're going to find a relationship. And so you're resting two non-stationary processes on each other. You've got a big, big problem because you're capturing trend, which has nothing to do with the causal connection between the two variables at all. 
because the, 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 the drift up and down that you're finding is entirely randomly based. It's all based on random shocks. Sorry, white noise shocks coming out of the system. The question is how does the variable react? You know, so, so um, but, what, but, but most people back, you know, back using the econometric approach, they were aware of this problem, but they just said, well, there are no integrated processes. Everything's stationary. Well, or it's trend stationary. What does that mean? Well, there's a trend, they're bringing something up, and around that trend, we have an auto regressive process or a moving average process. So you get rid of the trend, you get rid of the moving average process, you get rid of that serial correlation, and you're fine. You know, just no problems. And you just go run your OLS. Okay? But then what happened is the world started feeding back. <coughs> These ARIMA models, the ARIMA models were working better than these econometric models, models in, in, in describing the world, the forecasting. And this led to change. Did it change the minds of the people who were the, the big strong proponents of econometric, you know, the econometric approach? No, that almost never happened, right? The graduate students changed, right? The postdocs changed, right? Isn't that how the world works? They don't say anything to their professors. Like, yeah, I believe what those critics that you brought, but um, you know, they start, yeah, you got a point, right? Why? Right? Isn't that how change happens? That's why it's so critical. This is a really, really critical. It's also going to be the subject of a little homework I'm going to give you tonight. I'll be all excited about that. Um, um, no grades. Uh, let's use a guy grade. Yeah, sure. Sure, okay. Uh, we have to have feedback within 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm going to keep going here for a little bit longer. See where I'm going Okay. Yeah, let me just get through this stuff, and then we'll take a break. Uh, it's actually, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is pretty cool. Okay, are you familiar with something called transfer functions? Anybody ever heard of this? Yeah, you holding on okay there, Fiona? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Some of you will be uh, or are interested in the effects of events, and the, the Vox Jenkins people, um, this was really, really one of the great things that came out of this approach. It's called transfer function modeling, and transfer function came from engineering, and I'm not going to talk about this detail. We call, we call it today impact assessment. Well, we call it impact assessment for a while. Now we call it intervention analysis, typically. You know, this is the kind of thing. You know, like David Sanders has that piece, of, you know, about the remember the, the falsehoods war and approval. Right? You know, did the did the shock is an exogenous at least in theory an exogenous shock on government approval, on vote intention during a campaign? Did the debate have an effect on claims preferences? Right during the UK um, the last recent election turnout. You know, all kinds of. You know, that kind of affects them. Okay. Um, you, could, you, might, uh, you might be interested in this kind of thing. And you, could, you might expect an event to have a permanent effect, right, where it shifts the level of the series up and stays there. You might expect it to have, it to have a permanent, you know, well, let's go through one here. A bunch of different other numbers. Here's the basic effect, the basic kind of effects you expect. There's this abrupt permanent effect, right? You can get a gradual permanent effect. An abrupt temporary effect. Okay, you can have a gradual temporary. That's a little trickier because uh, you know it goes up and it tops out, right? Then it goes back down. You need a little bit more complicated modeling. And the way the way you think about these events is you think about it like this: is you know you're going along and you're in the land of zero, right? And then all of a sudden you get a one, right? Something switches on. You get a Falklands, and so now you're in the post Falklands. You're in the Falklands period or the post. Like debate period, right? It could also come up, right? Like you know, you know, it could be the, 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 the you know the you know, the uh, the Falklands period, and the Falklands is over, right? The Falklands battle is over. Now we're back down to zero, right? So you might, it depends on how you theorize about it. But the great thing is the empirics can sort it out. You don't even have to be settled out for priori. Uh, really, really important here when you're doing this kind of analysis. This was this was this was really all the rage in the 70s, and okay, even into the 80s, and it's still useful. It's still used quite a bit. You gotta be real careful with exploratory <coughs> event intervention analysis. You want it between confirmatory, so you want to have really, really strong priors. Why do you think that's the case? Well, it's easy to find effects. It's, oh yeah, look at that big spike in my data over there. What happened? Oh yeah, let's go see what happened. Oh yeah, yeah, it was uh, that happened. It must have been that. Uh, Whatever happened that day caused that spike. 
Well, that assumes the spike's real, right? That's the first thing. So you know, you're going to have a lot of error. And if it's a measurement error and you spike, you're going to be attributing causality or causal effect to it. So you know, it's better to have the prior, prior and also maybe some expectations about how you, how you think it worked. It's also nice to corroborate it with other kinds of evidence. If you think there's, for instance, a media effect on something, you might be able to do a cross-sectional analysis or a pool panel analysis, which will watch people who are actually exposed to those who weren't thinking about this earlier. So what you're doing is when you're modeling events, you're modeling a variable y as a function of this intervention i, so t, right? It has to be t. Um, if you uh, have a zero order model, the difference makes it a zero order model in this case. I know it gets confusing. It confuses me, as you already saw earlier. Uh, these orders mean different things in different contexts. Here, a zero order model means no y, t minus 1. So you have y as a function of the intervention. That's it. The first order, as we'll see in a moment, introduces y, t minus 1. Here is this, this, I think it's omega. Um, uh, you know, so it's yt, well, this would be yt, sorry, equals I, I, I sub t. And so if you're going along, you have a 0, 0, 0, and then you have a 1, right, times the omegas. Right? And so you basically have an abrupt permanent jump, right? This goes along, comes up by omega, and it stays there, right? And if we switch back off, then it comes back off. Right? That's, that's that story. What about a gradual permanent effect? Well, you get, a lot of people early on, they just model it like this. It's, oh, yeah, well, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.25, 0, 0.5, 0. 0.75, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then it might go back to 0. You just put it in the same model, and what are you going to predict? That's kind of gradual, linear. You know, but what if it's not quite right? How do you know? You just, you're just making it up, right? And how do you know? What if it's not linear? There's more not more general modeling strategies here in the first order models. It's really very, very useful to start doing this because now remember what we had this model before with the lag and coefficient. What do you have? You have an equilibrium, right? So you could have a nonlinear decay, right? For effect, right? We could think through what happens. We have our omega. We have this. What if this is one? What do we predict will happen? What if this? Phi is 1. 0, 0, 0, and then along with the top 1, what do we get? 0, 0, 0, just keep like this, and we get omega, right? So what do we get at the second point in time? Still 1. So what is it now? What do we predict here? So at the first point in time, y t minus 1 is 0, plus omega, ignore the et, right? So it's ignoring this plus et over here, just ignore that. So what do we get the second point in time? Not that hard. <coughs> well, it's phi, right? Times that, right? Plus that again, right? If phi, if phi is 1, then what do you get? It's omega plus a new omega, right? And the next time it's omega plus omega plus another omega, right? So you're going along. So basically, it goes like that. And then if it goes back off, what do you have? Then it develops off, right? <coughs> it doesn't disappear because of uh, phi is 1. What if phi is less than 1? Well, then you get the k, right? And this thing equilibrates, right? This will go up like this. And where is it going to go to? Right. It's going to go to the equilibrium. Whatever that is. So it's going to be. It's going to be the first point in time we'll get phi. I'm oh, sorry, get uh, omega. If phi is 0.5, what do you get in the second point in time? 0.5 times that plus an omega, right? So 0.5.
How do we know? That's quite possible. So what's the equilibrium? That is 9.5, which equals what? <coughs> but you don't need to remember it. It's just going to do it. Right? Just plug in the numbers. How long does this take? About 10, 15 seconds, right? 30 seconds. You know real quickly what's going on. So you can, it's great, it's just, just model the stuff with zero when you have. With zero, you just go back to what you had before. Right? Yt equals zero times yt minus one plus omega times the shock. Doesn't that look familiar? Yeah, that's what we had before. That's the zero order model. Right? Yt minus one is zero. We're right back there. Right? Just with the shock. So you don't have to settle it by assumption, right? You do the first order, and if it's just an abrupt permanent, then you know, yt minus 1 will be 0. It's really useful. Uh, you could also have effects that are spikes. You can incorporate in. Here you have changes in the changes in the shocks that you could be interested in. Maybe just 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. You can model both the changes, the difference the shock, and the level shock together. And so you don't have to solve things at all by assumption. This is a very, very common. There's higher order models. You can include the lag yt minus. One. The more common, the more important, are these compound effects where you model y as a function of t minus 1 plus the level of this intervention variable plus the difference of the intervention variable. So it allows you to capture long term effects, short term effects, permanent effects, gradual effects. I went through this a little bit faster. Um, uh, than I had planned to because we're kind of running a little bit on time for some of this, but um, I can't come back to you. It's just, you also have it in your slides. You send it to you. But the one way to think about these event effects, um, pretty much everything that we're going to be doing, you can think of effects. Bob Erickson and I just work on these election, timeline of election campaigns, and we actually build in time series models into these analyses of polls at the aggregate level and also preferences measured at the individual level. We have a book coming out in August uh, on this. Um, and this is the political scientist, Erickson, uh, the sociologist. Um, but here's what we call a bounce. And so you get a shock, right, and it decays. You can have, that's one type of effect. If you're interested in campaign effects, is this very interesting? This is interesting. Yes, yeah, this is, this is, when is it especially interesting? When you have a campaign. <laughs> <laughs> okay, assume a campaign. <laughs> and then you get a shock. A negative ad just a negative ad with that advertisement just goes online or on TV. Okay. Or if you really wanted to say, I mean, is this if, if, if you're in the advertising business and you go and you go get presentations, right? And you say, This this is our results of our analysis show when we run ads, we get a big we get a big bounce. I would run an ad before the election day. Do they win? I would run an ad uh, the day before election day. Ah, very smart. Very good. Well, that's one, that's one thing. But the problem is, is, from an advertising agency point of view, that's not going to earn you a whole lot of money. Right? <laughs> Another way to think about it is you want to be running them all the time. Because, they, <laughs> because, because the ads are going to decay unless you keep, you know, you've got to keep, keep, keep coming at them. The point of that, though, is that this is not a very, I mean, depending on how much decay, I mean, if the decay is really slow, then it's fine, right? If it's 0.95 parameter, well, if it's going to last a long time, a lot of it will. If it's a 0.2 parameter, it looks like, by the way, a lot of campaign effects, like advertising effects, are pretty short lived, which is interesting. And it's not surprising that politicians uh, have, uh, you know, in the very money election electoral cycle of the United States, are focusing their attention. In fact, there's so much money going in American politics, electoral politics at the moment, as you could spend. It's hard to spend it all, so you just run ads all the time, uh, everywhere, pretty much. Uh, here's a bump, which is very different. This is the kind of thing you'd really like to be able to show, I think, if you were an advertiser, would you? Look at this. We run our ads. What do we find? We find no bounce. We find a bump. Right. So you sell the bump. The bump is the bump is. Uh, so you know, sure, you could say here, yeah, you know, this might be useful, you know, to say. I agree that it, it, ads are most effective at the end, right? And much of the impact. But you can still try to spin it into you better advertise all the time, just because you don't want to fall behind or something. You never know. 
Um, here, you could say you better advertise all the time because every ad you run has a permanent lasting impact on your preferences and will ultimately influence the outcome. Right? That's the kind of thing you want. Perhaps more realistic, right? Uh, because I think that most people hearing your sales pitch on that are going to kind of go, yeah, uh, can I see your data, uh, right? Uh, they might rather see something like this, which I think is probably their prior, right? So ads can have permanent effects here, but also uh, temporary effects as well. Right? Combine, this is a, a hybrid effect, or in time series language, it should be a combined process. Notice what you have here in effect is you, in effect, have an integrated process, right? Add it together with an autoregressive process, right? There's a permanent component to the time series process and also a temporary autoregressive process. How do we know it's autoregressive? Because it's geometric and it's decay, right? And that's a good time to break. See you in 30 minutes.